that third and fourth verse again, just because they're so good. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Good evening and welcome to our edition of uh, Wednesday Night Live as we discuss and share about uh, the message on Sunday and also look at uh, an old catechism, uh, the questions that help define uh, the Lord, help define our relationship with the Lord and as we uh, kind of go back to our roots and look at some of these important things in scriptures. When I just continue to remind you to be praying for one another, if you have a directory, a good thing to do is walk down the list and pray for one another. And if there's a name you don't know, um, you can even call and get to know them and introduce yourself, uh, just like a handshake at church. And uh, Sometimes we don't take the opportunity to do something like that. And I would express again uh, the wonderful fellowship that can be had despite uh, the stay-at-home order. And of course, you know the stay-at-home order order is uh, till May 4th. And uh, and that uh, we look forward to uh, answers to whether or not uh, how things are going to proceed from there. Just so you know, I've always uh, kind of had a, a two-week uh, kind of rule. If if they say it's going to be two weeks, I expect a month. If they say that the order is going to be lifted on the 4th, I expect a couple more weeks. And so we will take it uh, uh, day by day. And as the 4th hit, I hope that we have more um, information for everyone. Until then, again, don't waste this opportunity to focus on your relationship on the Lord. Slow down. That's part of uh, when in the psalmist uh, and in other areas where it says, be still and know that I am God. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to be still, to that slow down to the point where you actually are thinking, focusing, and you are seeing God in these areas in your life. And so I encourage you to take the time to do that. Keep praying, um, missionaries. Um, I was reminded that um, many of the missionaries that we know that are on furlough, this is a difficult time. Uh, Sharon Rahili, missionary, in medical missions, she's a nurse and she's an instructor in Togo, West Africa, dealing with the so Southern Hospital and the Northern Hospital. Uh, she is greatly missed. She is currently here in the States but can't go anywhere. And so she has uh, a couple of really neat uh, letters put out. She is working on putting together a video so we could share that with you. Uh, other missionaries, the Frericks down in Peru. Uh, we're going to visit us as well, a father and son team. And uh, I used to know uh, Chuck Frericks, the grandfather, who also was a contemporary of Pastor Ralph and knew Pastor Ralph well. So be praying for those missionaries that are here on furlough. They long to be uh, in their ministries uh, with their churches back 
in their field of missions. Uh, just a reminder too, if you hadn't seen the link about uh, Pastor Ralph, an interview with his grandson, what a, what a wonderful blessing and testimony that is. would encourage you to check it out and um, what a, a blessing that will be. Encourage and look forward to hearing more uh, from Pastor Ralph. Um, so just, uh, just those few announcements. Uh, continue to um, find ways to connect and get involved in each other's lives. Well, let's uh, pray and let's look at one of the aspects that we didn't have time to go into uh, on Sunday uh, for the morning message. Let's pray. Lord, simply ask that as we gather tonight uh, that you will use uh, these avenues of video uh, to bless our hearts, to encourage us as we study um, and find ways uh, to make connections and fellowship as we uh, talk about your, your word, as we talk about the ministries that are going on around, around us and around the world. And so, Lord, we ask for your blessing. We ask that your spirit would lead us and guide us to the proper understanding of your word. And we thank you for the opportunity to share together. We ask for many blessings. We know that you will provide according to your will. And so we thank you for all that you are doing that is according to your will. Thank you that you never change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Psalm 133, the Psalm of Ascent, you know, I, I just want to reiterate, you know, think about... Um, what it was like to be in captivity for so long. If you think about that, uh, Israel was in captivity for 400 plus years in uh, Babylon, the Persian area, uh, and they're traveling back and they're headed back up and they're thinking about dwelling with the Lord in his temple to sanctify the temple, to be prepared to worship the Lord. And as they look at each other, as they walk back uh, up, as they go up, as they sing this song, I can't help but think as they look to each other and from side to side, arm in arm, thinking about how it is so, such a blessing to be together. And looking forward to praising God. Of course, we can relate in a little bit because many of us are stuck at home. Life is not the same. Life is not normal. And I trust that you are looking forward to the day when we can get out and we can praise God together, coming together in one voice um, and just uh, praising uh, God. In one of those things, it, it's amazing how much a blessing unity is to the church and how God really wants to bless and to release the power of the Holy Spirit when we dwell in unity. Of course, unity is not determined by likes and dislikes. It's not, tie, it's not tied uh, to, to overlooking different people's ideas, what it's tied to is God's character, which ties us to another verse. You remember in Ephesians 4, it talks all about the fact that God is not divided. God is unified within himself, between himself, uh, between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all are, are together with one purpose, one mind, and one desire. And that's where unity comes from, is our focus on the character of God. And what a blessing that is, as we look in John, of course, John chapter 14, uh, Jesus has been talking about with his disciples the fact that he's going away, and, and they don't understand, like, how could he go away, and why must he die? And, and he also <laughs> tells them that the Spirit will come. And it's that same spirit that is discussed in Ephesians 4 that says the spirit of unity or the unity that is of the spirit. 
God's Spirit defines unity. It's his character. And he tells them, the disciples, and he's telling us that we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us to the truth, the truth that is about God's character, to understand who God is. We need to not underestimate the value of knowing God. Knowing God, the Father, God, the Son, and especially God, the Holy Spirit. They're all one. They're unified together. And, um, and he, over and over, he tells the disciples, when the Helper comes, he says in verse 26 of chapter 15, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And it's interesting, and you need, if you want to learn about the Holy Spirit, you can look at these, uh, these section of verses. I've always told and I've always said, if you want to understand the Holy Spirit, look at uh, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 of John. And the two things that the Spirit does is helps us to understand God's Word, and He also makes, uh, brings, um, it says here, that it will bear witness about Christ. What's interesting, those are the two things that are neglected in a lot of uh, churches that are all about the Holy Spirit. And they talk about the Holy Spirit. Everything's about the Holy Spirit and being Holy Spirit empowered and all those things. But if you notice, one of the two things is they don't talk about God's Word. It's not about knowing God in His Word. Um, and it's not about bearing witness about Christ. It's just about having this power. But the Holy Spirit is very important. At the end of all of this teaching and the disciples, we now get um, to chapter 17. And chapter 17 happens to be amazing because it's the high priestly prayer. Jesus goes into a time of prayer, prayer with the Father, and so he's praying, and he's praying for his disciples, and in turn, he's praying for us. And as we had discussed about unity on Sunday in Psalm 133, I would uh, want to draw your attention. As we go through this prayer, as he's talking to the Father in heaven, as Christ on earth, 100% God, 100% man, and now he's praying to the Father for the disciples. He prays this, verse 8, he says, For I have given them the words that you gave me, that they have received them and have come to know the truth, that I came from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I am praying for them, he says. And in verse 9, he says, "But for I'm not praying for the world, but for those that you have given to me. So God's not, Jesus here is not praying for the whole world. Jesus is praying for those that have put their faith and trust in Christ, those that the Father has given to Christ, and those are the ones that God will give to, the Christ, to Christ when Christ returns and takes us home to be in heaven, to be his bride, the bride of Christ, the church. And it's interesting, if you go down to verse 11, he says, I am coming to you, talking to God, I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. You notice that Jesus identifies the very fact that the Father, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they're all one. And as they are one, Jesus is praying that we would be one just as they are one. But did you notice that he prays that they that he has given them the word? He is also talks about God's name. I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Look down at verse 14. Again, he says, I have given them your word, and the word and the world has hated them. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Hmm. I have given them the word, he says. Verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We go on in verse 19, and for their sake I have consecrated or set myself 
apart, I've consecrated myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Verse 20, I do not ask for these only, uh, but also for those who will believe in me. So not just the disciples, and this is why I say that he prayed this prayer, not just for the disciples, but he prayed it for us, because those who will believe. So Jesus knew that God was still going to give Christ new believers. That's us. Who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Again, notice in that section, he goes back to the importance of God's word. And, or, and, then he, and he prays that they may be one. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you loved me. Again, the importance of being one, unified. It goes down to God's glory, his essence, his character, the glory, the character that belongs to God, that was given to Jesus, that now Jesus is asking us to imitate, the, and he says that he, that work that he began in us, he will continue. That work of sanctifying us or making us holy in God's own image. It's interesting here that all of that is based on God's character. I want you to see in verse 26, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. It's interesting as we think about how to how do we be unified? Well, I want you to see a common theme. Through this we see the importance of understanding God through his word. God's word is mentioned over and over in this chapter. Not only that, but the importance of God's name. Focusing on who God is. And that is one of, if it's one of Jesus' prayer for us, how much more important, it, you know, could it be? That This is so important. Jesus prays that this would be so in our life. My prayer for us would be that we would be a fulfillment of this prayer, that we'd be reminded of who God is in his word, and that we would focus on who God is and, and his name. May God's name be on our lips daily, hourly, minute by minute. And that's the important part. Notice that God, the love that Jesus had for others, God gave him that Psalm 316 love or the Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Or the Philippians 2 love being made complete by not thinking about our own interest, but thinking about the interest of others. God gave us the secret to be able to be unified. And it's all in his name through his being obedient to his word and by loving others the way that he is love. God is unity. God is love. And that, you know, I hope that you can answer those questions and think about how important is unity? How important is unity? And is unity, uh, how important is unity to the growth of the church? Some things to think about as you think about Jesus' prayer and the importance of unity and the things that are involved in, in the secret of unity and how we have unity. That leaves us for a short time um, in dealing with the Heidelberg Confession and bring us back to our grassroots. It kind of ties in to Jesus' prayer to Psalm 133. And our fourth question, um, this is our our fourth week going through the catechism. I think it's about the sixth week that we've been doing these little chats on Wednesday night. And I encourage you to be thinking about this and, 
And uh, we've gone through, you know, how do we have comfort? Where does our comfort come from? It comes from knowing that Christ bought and paid for me. I'm not my own. I belong to Christ. That Christ has me. That nothing in this world can separate me from the love of Christ. Number two is, you know, how many things must we know to live and die in the joy of comfort? And that is, we need to know our sin. We need to know who delivered us from our sin. And third, how to be thankful to God and what he's done for us. This third thing we saw, which was a new question for maybe for some to think about, is how do I come to know my own misery? Or how do I come to know that I'm a sinner and that I'm in desperate need? And we talked and we looked at the verses in Romans that it's the law of God. The law of God is useful. We can't throw away the Old Testament. We can't throw away the first five books. They are so important. In fact, I would challenge you that almost every single doctrine ever in the whole Bible is found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And a lot, uh, all about Christ, all about our salvation, all about our needs. We can't unhitch ourselves from the law. It doesn't mean that God doesn't uh, want us to go worship in a temple and do all the sacrifice. That's not the point, because Christ fulfilled all of that. But the law still has a purpose. And that brings us to number four. What does God's law require of us? What is God's law? So, the law shows us our mem- our misery, shows us that we are sinners, shows us our depravity, that we are not good. There's none good. Only God is good. God is holy. So uh, what does God's law require of us? Why did God put, he says that he put the law of God on everyone's hearts. We can witness using God's law, the Ten Commandments. So what does it require of us? What does God want? Well, it's found actually in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. And a lot of us kind of take that for granted or or don't really use it to put it into practice. And, And that is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So God's law is there to remind us that we need to love God with every single part of our being. You know, with all of our strength, I uh, I shoveled gravel uh, yesterday, and uh, I was so blessed that the very last two loads, my son showed up, at, uh, just got done with work. Uh, can you imagine... Uh, he worked a 10-hour shift at Perry Pallets, uh, loading pallets and, and stacking pallets and, and uh, uh, you know, working hard all day. And, and he gets home and the first thing he does is, uh, can you load that gravel for me? But I was exhausted. And I used every ounce of my strength to try to finish the job before the rain came. And I was just, I was tapped out. And my son bailed me out and I am so grateful for that. My back is grateful for that. But here's the point that I'm making is is that how many of us go that far to love the Lord? Uh, to, with, all, to, with all of our strength, it takes a lot of heart. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. It's got to be something that you decide in your mind, that in your heart, that it's going to be the main focus and the strength that you're going to give your energy to it. You're going to do it. It's going to be active. Actively pursuing love the Lord. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't do the first commandment, you can't fulfill the second. The law is there to show us that we need to love the Lord. The law is also there to remind us that we, in loving the Lord, that we should be loving each other. This is part of unity, is loving each other. But here's the thing. The end of verse 40, we don't always talk about, and that is this. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He's talking about the Old Testament. 
if we can do these two things, it fulfills everything. That's why Jesus said, I've come to give you life, life more abundantly, and that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Jesus is a prime example of one who loves God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in so doing, he loves his neighbor as himself, Philippians chapter 2. And it didn't mean that mankind was right when Jesus loved them by dying on the cross. No, they were, we were utterly wicked. We were undeserving of God's love, but he loved us anyway. Think about how far that will go in your testimony. The only way that that's possible is if we love God. What does God require of us? Why, what does God's law require of us? And that is, simply, when we see God's law all through Scripture, it is there to remind us we need to love Him. We need to love Him. Unity is is all about him. It's all about his name. It's all about his glory, his worth, his worthy. It's all about his word. What will you do this week to love the Lord your God with all of your strength? It's got to be a decision of the mind. It's got to be in the heart. Purposeful. Purpose in your heart that you are going to love the Lord your God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time of study of just getting together as a church body. Pray that you'll use this to just encourage one another. Use your Holy Spirit, Lord, as you have directed and told us that your Spirit leads us to all the truth. Thank you for those that we've been praying for that, um, Lord, um, have been sick um, but are getting better uh, others that have had different uh, uh, procedures at the doctor um, that are doing better. And uh, just thank you that you have continued to watch over uh, this church body. And Lord, may we make it our aim, our desire, our focus to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Lord, may that make us better neighbors. We thank you and we praise you. We need your help. We are sinners. And Lord, uh, so we ask you to help us, remind us, prick our hearts that we may be a house un undivided, totally in love with our Savior. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
when 